Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the first Foundations webinar of 2020. Hopefully you've, you've all managed your way into Zoom or uh, viewing via Facebook Live. Um, there's a chat function, so if, um, if you want to ask any questions as we go through, then, then please do. And if you have any issues with sound or anything like that, then, then please pop a message in the chat box. So that's me, I'm Paul Smith, I'm Director of Foundations, I'm your host for your uh, webinar this afternoon. And we're building, currently building a webinar studio in our offices in Glossop. So, so in future, I may, I may be appearing live by video. But for today, you can just view the slides. If any of you have um, kind of called in, I think some of you may need to mute your microphones. It shouldn't come through the system. But uh, if, if anybody can um, kind of mute any microphones, that, that would really help, I think, for, for some of the people listening. So in case you're not aware of foundations, um, we're the government appointed national body for home improvement agencies, something that we've done since 2000. And since 2015, our remit was expanded to include supporting um, all local authorities with the delivery of disabled facilities grants, which we've obviously been doing now for a few years. Um, and that includes um, using the DFG quality standard. We'll come out and assess you against that for free or it's available as a, as a self-assessment on the website. We also do free training on DFG legislation and regulations, and we do some free DFG process workshops, which I'll mention a little bit later on. So about the webinars, it's a new thing that we're doing for 2020. We know that sometimes it can be difficult to um, find the time out to go and travel to events. And um, sometimes it can be difficult to get um, permission to travel. So trying to bring content straight to your desk. We're going to be doing them monthly. And there'll be content from foundations at each event. And then we've also got a range of partners that uh, will also be presenting during these. Um, during these things and use the chat feature. So if you've got any questions that you want to ask me or, or the people during the event, then, then please do use that and, uh, and make the most of the opportunity. So today's is the first one. So it's probably a little, little bit shorter than some of the other ones that we'll have in future. We've got, got certainly more guests lined up for the future one. So get, get the idea of it today and that they will grow and develop through the year. And in case you like a live event as well, um, I've, just noticed I put the wrong date on there. The road shows are actually March 2020 rather than October 2019. And in March, we'll be visiting Birmingham, Leeds, and we'll be doing two shows in London. And the um, agenda we're just finalising at the moment will include a DFG masterclass. So details on the allocations for 2020 will be coming soon. So we're doing a masterclass on how to spend that uh, quicker and better. We'll have some uh, presentations on Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, using DFG around falls, um, developments in the private rented sector, and of course always we'll have a local good practice session to each event as well. So if you want to book up for those I would recommend doing that quite quickly, you can find the details on the Foundation's website, um, but Leeds is almost full. If we didn't have two events on London, in London that would already be full and Birmingham's not far behind, so um, most of the tickets have already gone, so if you do want to come along then um, please book those quickly. So for this month, we've got um, four items on the agenda. Number one is a, a new tool that we've got called Should I Stay that I'd like to share with you and um, get your feedback on. And we've got a video from Arcadia Architects on designing complex adaptations. And we talk about dynamic procurement systems. You may have heard about a few, um, few local authorities using that for DFG. And then we've got uh, a sneak preview, especially for the first webinar audience, of the DFG Delta data, which, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it was the returns that each local authority made on their DFG activity in 2018-19. Um, all that data was collected, we've analysed it, and uh, we're going to give you a preview of some of that information. So, should I stay? So this is a new tool that uh, I've been working on, and. Um, You've read my blog you, you'll know about it's, it's gestation on a long train journey but i think case workers in particular and, and probably ot's as well when you go into somebody's home 
most people will say that they want to stay there almost regardless of whether that's the best thing for them or not and it can be difficult to start those conversations about actually there's other opportunities available maybe it's moving in with family maybe it's moving into extra care housing or sheltered housing and how do you kind of go through that conversation in, in a kind of calm sensible way that allows somebody to come to a rational decision about how they should do that there are other housing option tools about um, some of those ask quite a lot of questions and then don't really get to the the nub of actually should you stay or not so we've developed this little tool that we'd like you to have a look at um, you can have a play with it yourself at shouldistay.co.uk and it's designed to help guide a conversation between a caseworker and an OT and, and, and somebody who might be thinking about moving. So I will bring it up for you now and I will show you how it works. So this is what it looks like. So it's, it's fairly basic at the moment. We've just kind of been testing it and playing with it and uh, it's, it's there for you to, you to have a go with. So I'll go through how it works. So basically in the top box, you just put the person's name. So let's say we're having a conversation with, with Bob. And then in these next four boxes, it's where you look at the options that they might want to consider. So it, it could be different for each person, but let's assume that Bob, for example, is um, interested in extra care housing. That's one option. Is interested in potentially moving in with family. He's interested in, in a bungalow he's seen just down the road and possibly a sheltered housing scheme and the other side of town. And these, these can be whatever you like and it will compare these options against the option of staying. So you choose, choose the options with, with Bob. And then what you do next is look at how important each of those factors are to Bob in terms of his this is based on some research on um, looking at what people have said are the most important things to them when they move in in later life. So quickly for each one of those, you decide on a scale of one to ten, talking with Bob, how important they are to him. So for instance, the first one, living close to family, how important is that to Bob? So let's say on a scale of, of zero to ten, that's an eight. Um, Living close to friends, he's not quite so concerned about. Weekly cost of living uh, is, is an issue for him. Um, equity in his home, again, he's, he's kind of built up equity over a period of time and he's, he's interested in maintaining that. Um, difficulty of how, how difficult it would be to move. Control of how he can control his life, how much control he will have over his life when he moves, how important that is to him. Pride in his home, how proud is he, how, how much does that matter to him, how proud he is of, of what his home looks like and, and what it looks like for him. Um, living close to shops and other services, how important is that? Um, how much will it suit or how important is that the home suits him as he gets older? So being adaptable. Give that another rating, uh, give that one a six and then how important is being able to manage cleaning and repairs? So very quickly just gone through those and you would obviously go through a conversation with Bob and he would come to a view on how important each of those are to him. So once that's set, you can see the, the um, spread of answers there. You move on to the next section. And you can see at the top there are the four options that are put in on the first screen. So extra care housing, moving in with family, the bungalow and the sheltered housing scheme. And then the left here are the um, 10 questions or, or 10 criteria from the previous scheme, from the free, previous page, sorry. So for each one of those, it's just a case of talking to Bob and looking at whether each one of those is worse than where he is now, the same as where he is now, or better than where he is now. So, so the extra care scheme is slightly further away from family, slightly close to friends. Uh, it would cost him a little bit more, so he'd be slightly worse off living there. Um, 
he would retain some of the equity in his home. He would have some difficulty moving. Um, he would have more control over the um, how he lives his life. He would be um, proud to live in this extra care scheme. He would live close to the shops and services. It would suit him as he gets older and um, it'd be much better in terms of managing cleaning and repairs, for example. And then with the other options, you, you go through the same questions. So I'll just tick a few of those just to show you how it works. And it's, it's as simple as you think whether it would be same is now for each of you, each of your four alternative options. I'm just doing these randomly for, for the sake of demonstrating it. When you've done the four options, you click on get the best decision. And based on um, the options you've chosen, whether they were better, the worse or same, and um, the ranking of, of those different options. For Bob, the um, clear choice is extra care housing, followed by sheltered housing and moving in with family. I said I did those fairly randomly. Um, but staying at home is always always rated as zero, because that's the, the kind of base quo option. So a positive score means that it's it's potentially a better option than whereas now score below zero is an option. So that's as, as simple as it is. It's, it's about guiding a conversation between you and somebody else who, who's thinking about moving and um, trying using this, um, using this matrix based on what's called a Pew matrix. And it gets you to the point where you can have kind of a, hopefully a sensible conversation with somebody about whether it's better or not for them to move. So as I say, it's available at shouldistay.co.uk. Um, be great to give it a try with um, some people when you're doing visits and be very interested in your um, feedback on how it works. It, it's very much just a, a kind of prototype at the moment. A uh, couple of questions. Um, can they be linked to the HIA case manager? Um, potentially that's something we could do in the future, I think. Um, probably something to add about pets and gardens. Potentially, I, this was based on some research um, on the top 10 questions, uh, obviously other, other, other supplemental ones, but um, we, we can change the questions going forwards. And uh, somebody else asked about how do these fit with the options in the area? So, so you would pick um, which options are available in your area. You, you, can, you can put whatever options are in there that you like. I mean, it, it could be, um, I, I don't know, what, uh, moving into a, a kind of small home down the street. It, it could be moving to, to New Zealand. You, you can put in whatever, um, whatever Bob thinks are, are viable options for him. The, uh, you can print off the results or print the pages as a PDF um, and do it like that. At the moment, none of the results are, are saved anywhere, so there's no kind of GDPR issues. This is, is kind of very much the first, um, first prototype of it. So if people think it's useful and it, it works, then we'll, we'll carry on developing it and um, take on board your suggestions. So the web address is shouldistay.co.uk. And it's, it's on the slides for this, uh, this webinar. It's been recorded, so you'll be able to have a look at it afterwards. Um, also, if, if you go onto the Foundation's website and look at the news and blogs, um, that there's my description of how I came up with it. So you, you can find all the details there. It's, it's also available on uh, as one of the pages on findmyhia.org.uk, which is the directory of home improvement agencies. There's, there's a variety of places you can find it. Um, so, so have a play and, and see what you think. So thank you, Stephen. That, that it looks good for the, our first, first impressions. A couple of bits and bits and pieces of adverts. We've got some training courses coming up next month. So in both London and Manchester, we've got um, caseworker skills sessions where we've got an experienced caseworker who will be going through um, giving you the benefit of experiencing in terms of caseworking and how you should go about that. Um, in London, we've got Rachel Russell from Salford University, who worked with us on the DFG review. Um, we'll be doing a half-day session on outcome measures around DFG. 
and we've also got two lots of two-day training on the housing health and safety rating system. So one of those is in London and another one of those is in uh, Manchester, again coming up shortly. So while I have, I have a quick drink, um, now I've got a short video from Arcadia Architects. We did, we did a, um, a test webinar um, just before Christmas where, where we showed this video. Now there's a lot more of you this time. So it's, it's a really interesting video from an architect's firm from Southwest London. They've done some really interesting um, projects. It's kind of larger, kind of more complex near future. And they've done this little video for us that um, gives their experience on, on how to design the more complex adaptations. Hello and welcome to our webinar. We are a firm of architects called Arcadia and we're going to talk about the design of, of larger house adaptations. Firstly we're going to give a brief introduction to Arcadia before highlighting a few key design considerations when looking at larger house adaptations. After this we will run through a few typical issues which may occur throughout the course of a similar project and finally we will discuss how a holistic approach to design will really benefit all involved in the project. Arcadia is a firm of architects and planners based in South West London and we have been in existence for over 25 years. Our expertise lies in design for older people and people with disabilities. Projects range in scale from extensions and alterations to single properties to large new build developments of up to 90 units. Our values are to be friendly, specialist and reliable. Our vision is to be responsive, efficient, progressive and award winning. Building progressive design solutions that enable people to live with dignity. We have worked on numerous Disabled Facilities Grants projects and we are looking to share our experiences and knowledge on these projects through this webinar. Our experiences range across a number of London boroughs for both adult and child cases. We work on all various job stages from concept design and planning through to project management on site. During these different stages we work closely with HIA officers, occupational therapists, surveyors, contractors and most importantly, the person who the adaptation is for and their family and carers. There are a variety of different scales of adaptations, from a single intervention, like a grab rail, which we would class as a minor adaptation, to larger extensions, which might incorporate several different interventions, which we class as major adaptations. The major adaptations is what this webinar will focus on. As the scale of the adaptation increases, the cost of the project normally increases, and the time it will take to complete will also increase. There are other factors which must be considered in large adaptations when compared to smaller ones. The project may need planning approval, party wall awards and building control, and generally more people will be involved in the project. When designing Disabled Facilities Grants projects, there are many different design aspects to consider. We would like to highlight six areas which we prioritise in the design process. These are light, colour and contrast, user needs, space and privacy, views and window sills, noise, finishes, and specialist equipment and electrics. Other considerations include quality of building fabric, passive design, flexibility of layouts, different user groups, access outside, and the use of technology. But unfortunately, we do not have time to cover all of these within 20 minutes. The environment created can enhance well-being, and when the design is approached in a holistic manner, taking into account all these different considerations, it benefits all users. Well-lit environments create healthier spaces. Light helps to set our daily rhythms and creates more pleasant places to live. As we age, our vision changes and it can be increasingly difficult to see contrast and tone. The thickening and yellowing of the lens of our eye alters the way we perceive colour. As you can see, it makes everyday task of trying to locate a door much more difficult. Colour contrast can be used to help with visual impairments especially when dealing with people who have dementia. The image on the left represents poor contrast between the floor, walls and doors and for people with visual impairments it can be almost impossible to locate the door. Given most new buildings are painted beige and have timber doors, this is a common problem. The image on the right uses colours which contrast considerably more and this will make it easier for people with visual impairments to locate the door. A difference in light reflectance value of 30 points is recommended between different finishes. This doesn't necessarily mean a different colour has to be used, and different shades of the same colour can often offer the required difference. These are some examples of different colour palettes which achieve the necessary difference in light reflectance values. 
as you can see, offering the right contrast does not mean the door has to be a bright colour, which is a common misconception. The image on the right could be further improved by contrasting the door frame to the door. This shows a typical section through a building prior to an extension being added. As you can see, there is a reasonable amount of light penetrating into the room. As an extension is added, you can see that light penetrates the same distance, however this will leave a dark area towards the rear of the room, as the room has doubled in length. Increasing the size of the window helps, and generally the larger the window the better. It can really help people with everyday tasks, especially if they have impaired vision. The preferable option is to include skylights. The amount of light the room receives is significantly greater from a skylight compared to a window, and they are a relatively inexpensive addition for the game. We believe skylights are essential to maintain high levels of natural light. Often other people live in the houses where the person who is the disabled facility is granted for. This could be a partner, child or grandchild who can often be helping care for the person. The home is also a work environment as well for paid carers. A key part of the DFG process is to allow people to live with dignity in their own home and they need a certain level of privacy in order to do so. The designer needs to think of the other people living or working in the property. It is likely that if the space is not suitable for them, the care and support they will be able to provide will not be as good, affecting the client. The plan shown here was an extension for an elderly lady, but her husband, who provided the majority of her care, also had mobility issues. His room was at first floor, however we added an extra door to the ground floor shower room so he could use the room without disturbing her. Obviously, this is an additional cost, but if you fell down the stairs the cost would be greater, both financially and in many other ways. This shows a visitor entering the property and wants to use the bathroom. As you can see, they have to enter through the person's bedroom, which if they, the person was sleeping or receiving care, would be a huge invasion of privacy and could represent a loss of dignity. Creating an additional door to the bathroom directly from the hall protects the privacy and dignity of the client whilst allowing other people to use the bathroom, making the most out of the adaptation. There are many design considerations when looking at the position of windows and their effect on layout. Window design should be looked at in parallel with furniture layout, neighbouring properties, need for light and creation of views. From the planning point of view, windows have to be designed to avoid overlooking of neighbouring properties. Environmentally, windows should be placed to maximise light but to avoid excess heat loss and or heat gain. From a well-being point of view, low sills and active views are better for the user. If a window sill is put in at the standard 800mm from floor level, a person who is often lying in bed or in a chair will not benefit fully from the view. The sill height should be a maximum of 600mm from floor level in order to allow views out. Noise and acoustic control are essential to spaces where adaptations are occurring. It is important to consider the movement of noise within the house, from the surroundings, inwards and the effect on the user, but also the effect of noise from the property on the surrounding properties. We had a child case where the child was extremely sensitive to noise and loud noises would cause her to fit. We had to undertake a, a number of additional steps including fitting soundproof doors because of the proximity of the new room to the main family living area. Designs can be adapted to ensure there is adequate space separation between bedrooms and living areas where noisier activities such as watching TV may take place. On this project we were able to separate the space by providing a small garden terrace which meant the parents would not be worried about disturbing the child when watching TV once the child had gone to bed. The child in this case also used to call out frequently during the night, disturbing the sleep of his brother. This separation not only improved his sleep, but also that of other family members. It is worth bearing in mind that every client is different. On one of our projects, the client wants to be close to the family and have their bedroom directly off the kitchen to maintain involvement in family life. Appropriate finishes are essential. It is important not to create an institutional feel to a home environment which is often viewed negatively, particularly by the client and often other family members who do not want their home to look like it has been adapted for a disabled person. There is often a stigma attached to certain finishes and equipment and it can lead to people feeling ashamed as they don't want their relatives and friends to view them differently once an adaptation has been undertaken. A lot of equipment is function over form. It is obviously important that any piece of equipment carries out the function it is designed for but equally it's important it is well designed and looks appropriate to be in a domestic environment. A common finish which causes a debate between the grant officer and the client on almost every project is the floor finish. The surface needs to be anti-slip and easy to clean to meet the grant requirements. 
Final wet room flooring achieves this and can look great, but the correct colours and products are needed to avoid the institutional look. Most major interventions require specialist equipment of one kind or another. The equipment needs to be fully coordinated into the design to maximise usability and ensure the client is getting the maximum functionality. Large pieces of equipment such as hoists and lifts often have long lead-in times, so orders need to be placed towards the beginning of the construction period. Close liaison with the manufacturers early in the design process is key to ensure the necessary structure and power supplies are in the correct place. Any equipment must be future-proof. Close working with the occupational therapist will ensure products are installed which will last. It is more cost-effective to fit products whilst the other works are going on than coming back in three months' time after completion to fit additional equipment. Typical equipment include rise and fall basins and ceiling track hoists. It's important to ensure the warranty length meets the local authority requirements and any servicing that is required to keep the warranty valid is in place. No matter how well planned a project is, there are always unexpected issues which arise during the construction of a major adaptation. There are often too many external factors for unexpected events not to happen. The key is not to panic, as all problems are solvable. And we will now cover some typical issues that have arisen on projects which we have been involved in. The issues we are going to look at are drainage and other services, conflict of specification versus expectation, fire, existing fabric, e.g. asbestos, level access, circulation in the house, and controls such as window heating, lights and switches. It is important to know the locations of services prior to construction and plan accordingly. A thorough site survey at the beginning of the project covering the standard utilities should be enough in the majority of cases. It is common to have a public sewer along the back of a property. In order to construct near this, a build-over agreement will be required from the local sewerage supplier. This may require a couple of additional drawings and liaison to obtain an agreement. Adding roof area requires additional rainwater drainage, which needs to be effectively drained away or added into the existing stormwater system. Due to changes in rules around combined storm and foul water sewers, building control often requires sakeways to help reduce the effect of the additional water drainage on the sewer system. Wet rooms will create additional hot water requirements through showers and radiators. This could impact the existing boiler and heating system, which sometimes needs to be upgraded to cope with additional demand. If the property has a very old boiler, it may require an upgrade regardless on health and safety grounds. In all cases, service providers and utilities companies should be contacted as early into the design process as possible where their input is required. They are notoriously slow at responding to information and this can lead to delays on site if the appropriate measures are not already in place prior to starting construction. Fire integrity and fire warning systems are vitally important in any construction project. Certain walls and doors will require higher levels of fire rating. For example, if an adaptation is required to a three-storey property, the stairway needs to be fully enclosed in fire-rated walls and all doors from this area to all rooms except bathrooms and kitchens need to be fire doors. The minimum requirement for alarms is a hardwired heat detector in the kitchen and a hardwired smoke alarm in a hall at each floor. It is often better to have one in the client bedrooms too, especially if they have impaired hearing. If a stairway is not protected, an alternative scope route is needed. This is often an egress window at first floor, which needs to be a minimum of 450mm by 450mm. When constructing a new ground floor bedroom, it is often a good idea, where possible, to have direct escape to the outside. The existing age and quality of the building can affect cost and time scale for projects. Prior to starting a project, it is important to de-risk the chance of unforeseen work. Common risks include asbestos, inappropriate structure, blame pasta, damp proofing, condensation and damp, and rotten timber. Many of these problems can be identified through the smell and sight of damp. This is often located at low level in the corner of rooms, and should this be found, a more intrusive assessment may be required to identify the source of the gap. Level access is key for clients with no mobility, or wheelchair users. Providing step-free, unobstructed access from inside to outside is generally a basic requirement of a large adaptation. This needs to be throughout the inside of the property as well. Typically, older properties were built above ground to protect from rising damp. This results in a step into the property. This can be a huge barrier to people with low mobility. 
and wheelchair users. A typical solution is to provide a ramp or slope. This is fairly simple, but worth bearing in mind that a 1 in 15 slope should be the maximum gradient, and if the site allows, it will be worth reducing this to 1 in 20 or shallower. A level threshold door should be used, and drainage will be required at the threshold junction to avoid water ingress into the property. A change in material is generally important at the threshold, so people who are visually impaired are able to distinguish an inside or an outside finish. However, when dealing with people who have dementia, this can be seen as a barrier, and if possible the threshold should be seamless in this scenario. Thinking about circulation is very important, and the best way to do this is to think about the routes the clan will use. It is important they are able to go as many rooms as a house as possible in order to retain as much independence as possible. Doors may need widening, widening to allow for wheelchair access, typically 850mm clear opening, including any door handles which protrude is enough. However, this may need to be wider if the client has a larger wheelchair. Often the motorised chairs require wider openings. Sliding doors can be a great space saver and might be easier for the client to operate. It is worth bearing in mind that the area the pocket door slides into creates a hollow area of wall which is not suitable for grab rails to be fixed into. It is important that controls are accessible for the client. This includes light switches, electrical sockets and window handles. There are height recommendations in the building regulations but it is worth checking with the client and occupational therapist that these heights are suitable. If the client is visually impaired, controls can also be colour contrasting to make them easier to see. PAR sensors can also be used to operate lights, which is extremely useful in wet rooms, where it can often be difficult to locate a light switch during the night when many clients have to use the bathroom. This can help to prevent falls and is a relatively inexpensive addition. Low surface temperature radiators are important, especially in child cases where there is a risk of burning on a standard radiator. We cannot stress enough how important a collaborative approach is to each larger adaptation. There are so many people involved in the project with a wealth of experience to use. This experience will vary and the best projects are the ones that take everyone's expertise into account. The key to this approach is good and clear communication. It should never be forgotten that the client is the most important member of the design team. It is vital to listen to the client and family members as they are often experts on their own home and their needs. Taking into account their views will provide the best solution. There are so many different factors and considerations to take in when undertaking a large adaptation. The key is to involve the client, family and carer at every step and include them in the decision making process. This will create a better adaptation and they will enjoy the process more, which can otherwise cause a lot of upheaval, strain and inconvenience. If possible, it is good to look to improve other aspects of the property and living environment to future-proof for the client to improve health and safety in their home and to improve energy loss. We hope this has been an informative webinar and many thanks for listening. We welcome any feedback you may have. So thank you to Mark and, and Catherine at Arcadia Architects for doing that for us. That's an amazing video they put together at quite short notice last time. Um, and there's, um, there's a great document that they did that's on the foundation's website about which contains some of the details they shared in that so in that video so if you want to look that up it's uh, well worth a read if you're looking at more complex schemes so next bit i just wanted to talk about was dynamic purchasing systems which seem to be get, uh, gaining a bit of traction around um, around dfg recently quite a few local authorities are looking at it as a way of, of managing their approved lists of builders so I, th I think there are kind of all sorts of issues around how you manage builders and DFGs. Um, I've done a couple of blogs about it in the past. But I think one of the key things is around typically how DFG spend um, ebbs and flows through the year. So you just kind of line up the months. And this, this is, I think, typical for, for quite a lot of local authorities that, that kind of this time of year, the amount of projects that are underway is, is kind of ramping up as everyone looks to spend as much of their budget as they can before the end of March. And then what that usually means is that kind of the pipeline runs out towards the end of March and, and there aren't new jobs to go on site kind of April, May, or you're kind of building that back up again by um, doing the designs and going through the, the tender process. Start to pick up again a little bit kind of June and July, but then kind of summer holidays kick in and it kind of tails off again a little bit in August. And then from September, it starts to pick up again through the um, through to the end of the year. And I think this, this is kind of problematic in a couple of ways in that the 
um, referrals that come through don't follow this kind of pattern. So they're a little bit more regular through the year. And it makes it really quite difficult for builders to kind of plan their year out and to um, kind of rely on DFG as, as a regular source of income for them, which means they quite often go and do different sorts of work and then aren't available when you need them to do um, adaptations quickly sometimes. So part of that is, um, I think kind of feeds into having a new way of, of looking after contractors and tendering around these sort of projects. And one way that I've kind of mentioned that some local authorities are looking at it is a dynamic procurement system, which sounds a complicated name, but it's, it's actually fairly straightforward in that it's, it's very similar to a framework agreement but the main differences are that with, with a framework agreement, you set that out at the start, all the contractors join at the start and then remain part of the framework for the duration of, of the term of that agreement. With a dynamic procurement system, new contractors you can um, assess and they can join at any time during the term of the, of the framework. And the other issue is that it must be run completely online. So you can't have any um, paper documents that kind of go backwards and forwards as part of a, a dynamic procurement system. And so I, th I think you can see why for DFG, it's, it's quite a neat way of managing an approved list, which you can advertise through um, your kind of OGU notices and your other kind of procurement portals for builders, but it's not a one-off thing. You, you could get a, perhaps 10, 10 or so at the start and then kind of supplement that over, over the years. And it also allows contractors to submit bids for individual jobs through this kind of online portal that you have. And some um, DPS systems allow pretty much that, that they, you would send out a, a specification and a drawing electronically to all the builders on the list. And then they would, in, in whatever fashion, price that and send them back through, through your DPS system. Which again does um, does kind of speed it up from the old kind of paper-based systems that go out in the post, but still um, a little clunky in terms of getting lots of people, spending lots of time doing lots of tendering. So a system that we designed um, a couple of years ago is, is a system called DFG Tenders, and this is what it does. How it works in practice, and you, if anybody wants a demo of this, then, then please get in touch, is that you have a um, your standard specification, usually for level access showers, and your contractors pre-price each item on that schedule. Um, then that, that's loaded up into the DFG tender system. And then for each job, you specify which items from your standard spec you need. They're all pre-priced, so in the background, it calculates the price from each contractor. So it's a bit like using Compare the Market to um, look at your car insurance. You put in all the details of, of the bathroom rather than of your car, and it comes up with the prices um, from all your local contractors for that particular bathroom. And then you can choose which contractor, and you, there's a different ways that you can choose, either on price or quality or a mixture of the two, and then notified automatically through the system. There's more details at www.dfgtenders.co.uk if you want to have a look at it. And um, we also include a free license to use the HIA Works contracts. I know a lot of people use JCT contracts and other, other types, um, but this one's uh, a contract which we've worked with a, a, a kind of a leading barrister on developing, and it's specifically for this type of work. So it's all done in plain English fairly short and, and concise 
and um, works really well. So if you're interested in, in DFG tenders, if you're interested in the HI Works contracts, then please get to a trip of foundations and we'll set you up a demo. So the final bit we have to do then is the DFG Delta data return, which, which is a bit of a mouthful to say. It used to be called LogusNet. So for some of you who've been doing this for a while, you've probably heard of the LogusNet return. It used to be the way that local authorities bid for how much funding they got in, in the subsequent year. But um, that was um, stopped in 2009, 10. And um, so it wasn't a mandatory return for a number of years. And you see that this is the number of local authorities that returned it over the last 10 years or so, which generally fell year on year. It's switched to a new system called Delta from this year, which had some slightly different questions. And all but one local authority in England made a full return um, using the Delta system this year. So from that data, um, I'm going to quickly go through some of the highlights of that, um, of that return for you. So these are the headlines. So based on um, all the returns that came in, Across England, 58,200 grant applications were made. And of those, 53,500 grants were completed. Uh, plus, there's 142 local authorities that still have their own housing stock, so kind of council housing. They completed another 32,900 adaptations. One of the interesting questions that was new for this year was around the number of OTs and trusted assessors employed to assess DFGs. So 52 of the 200 and odd um, district councils, um, so those without a social services department, are now employing OTs, at least on a part-time basis, to help with the assessment of DFGs. And 30 districts have both an OT and trusted assessor. Um, and then there's another 25 districts that are just using trusted assessors as part of their process. So in total, um, there are about 455 trusted assessors now working on DFG across England, um, doing a, a significant percentage of, of the DFG assessments that are going forwards. So that, those are the headline figures, and I'll go through some of the details behind those and then some of the other bits and pieces that were covered by the um, return. But what I should say is that um, what was clear is that some local authorities had a different definition on some of the um, questions than others, or, or, or wouldn't particularly understand what a, um, a grant application is and where that comes in the process. So I'll, I'll mention that as we go through the data. So as you're hopefully all aware, the DFG budget went up in uh, as part of the 2015 Comprehensive Spending Review and significantly increased. The question marks that you can see on the later um, bars there indicate that the new Delta returns didn't ask for how much a local authority contributed over and above their allocation. So we haven't got the figures for that, but you can see that generally the amount that local authorities contribute over and above the DFG allocation is relatively small these days. And so that increase in funding is now seeing a increase in the number of DFGs that are done per local authority. So for 2018-19, there were 326 local authorities. And if you take the average number of DFGs that they did, um, it now averages something around just under 170. So you see that that's increased from around about 120 in 2015-16. So the extra funding is now starting to see some real increases in activity across the FG. But th this is, I think, kind of one of the um, strange trends or, or lack of trend in, in DFG funding. So since 2008-9, the questions have always asked for a breakdown in terms of value of, of DF, DFGs approved. So looking at um, percentage of cases under 5,000, the percentage between 5 and 15,000, and then how many cost over 15,000. You see that that's remained pretty much static over the last 10 years. In fact, the figures for 2018-19 aren't that different to the figures from 2009-10. 
over half of all grants are below five thousand pounds around a third are between five and fifteen thousand and really small percentages less than ten percent are over fifteen thousand I guess it'd be interesting to see if anybody's got any views on that. Um, I think inflation, you would assume, it would have played a part and those prices would have increased. Um, but as you can see, they, they've stayed very, very still over that 10 year period. And this was another one that was, that was a little surprising. I, I suppose it probably wasn't surprising that the number of £30,000 grants decreased in the early part of the last decade as kind of austerity bits and budgets were under strain. But as the DFG budget increased kind of from 2015-16, it did see kind of a, a bounce to a certain extent and, and more maximum grants were being awarded. But then in 2018-19, that had fallen right back down again. And now a lot of local authorities have RRO policies now that allow them to do grants over 30,000. So this included those, or that was what the question asked. But um, has anybody got any comments? Do you see a drop in the number of large adaptations that you're doing? Okay, so if Helen sees more uh, more adaptations, larger adaptations for children. And Joseph Sanders can kind of see an increase. So I suppose it may be that people didn't understand when they're ask, answering the question that he did include grants so above thirty thousand as well as the ones at thirty thousand. Um, but it did seem strange that that figure had gone down given that so many RRO policies now allow you to go over and above 30,000. In terms of tenure, this is the breakdown between um, those in the private rent that get to DFG, so that's that kind of small blue section at the bottom. Those in housing association properties are the um, growing green block in the middle and then the um, kind of lilac block at the top is the proportion of homeowners. As you can see the trend is that the proportion of DFG going to housing association properties is has eased up by about a percentage point or two every year since 2010 and 11. And the column right at the right hand side is the split between um, private rent, housing association and owner occupied properties in England. You can see there, there is quite a mismatch between um, the amount of grant going to housing association properties and the number of housing association properties in England in particular. And just point out this doesn't include council housing because that, that's funded separately. So these are just housing association, private, ten, private landlord, private tenant and homeowners. I think can take John's point that there are often more vulnerable people in social housing, but I think the data shows that there are increasingly um, lots of vulnerable people in the private rented sector as well. And that's one of the topics we'll be covering during the next round of roadshows, where the National Landlords Association have done some research on this, and uh, we'll be making some, some recommendations and proposals. Another one that's um, shifted a little over time is the trend in the age of the disabled person. So um, slightly diff different this year in that the age bands were changed to reflect um, kind of children, working age adults and, and people of retirement age. Whereas in previous um, returns, it was um, kind of arbitrarily uh, people who are aged under 20, people aged 20 to 60 and people aged over 60. But the general trend has been a decrease in the number of people um, kind of over 60 or of retirement age that are getting DFGs 
and a steady increase in the number of people who were engaged that have been um, successful by the DFGs. So this is proportions rather, rather than number. Obviously, as, as the budget's kind of more have been done overall, you see that there is definitely a trend towards um, towards working age and, and, and rather than, than older people. I, th I think my kind of view on this is possibly something to do with the means test. I know a lot of local authorities have means test for, for smaller grants now, but um, as pensions have gone up with inflation, the means test doesn't stop with that. So I think quite, in quite a lot of areas, there would be um, probably less older people going through the means test. We've got, got some questions, got some um, things on means testing in a little while. Um, so I was just asking why there were no 2017 18 figures is because there wasn't a big enough um, or enough returns on the, on the longus net system as it was then. It was being phased out, so it wasn't particularly pushed last year. So um, don't have any data for 2017 18, but all the 2018 19 figures are based on 99.7% um, of local authorities. So this one is around approval times. And I think this is one where I think some of the people answering this question um, got confused between um, an application and an approval, or an application and a, um, an OT recommendation. So the average um, from the data returned was 33 days between grant application and grant approval. And um, grant application is when you've got um, your assessment, you've got your drawings, you've got the completed application form, you've got all your prices and everything ready to, to make the approval. Rather than, I think some local authorities took it as um, application was when the occupational therapist made a, made a recommendation, which, which isn't the case. So, so I think some of the longer timescales actually include the, the preparation of the, uh, of the application. But you can see that even so, there are quite a few that um, are within the um, kind of average of 33 days. Um, and, and given the um, guidance, I think the, uh, the guidance give you a time scale of 31 days. So most local authorities are within that kind of time period, but there are some that take quite considerably longer. And there were some local authorities, there are three actually, that um, make during that, that financial year, which is where you can defer payment by up to 12 months. So completion times. So this is the time from grant approval to completion. The guidance says that should be done within, within 80 days. And again, it may be that a couple of local authorities have got confused between um, grant application and grant approval. But generally, um, I think it's good that over half are, are within the target time. But there are some that um, their average is, is much longer than that. So it'd be interesting to go back and look at some of those and see if kind of particularly your timescales between um, applicants approval and completion at kind of 100, 150 or to 200 days. And I think that's probably uh, something to do with contractor lists and, and availability of contractors and, and how you manage those. So if, if your times are kind of in, in the three figures, then, then please do get in touch and, and we're very happy to help with those sort of issues. Means testing. Um, as we said in the DFG review, really, it, it's become probably a fairly binary test in that you either get a full grant or you get nothing for the, for the vast majority of people. And in 2018-19, only 17.8% of approved DFGs have some sort of contribution. So I think that's come down significantly because a lot of local authorities don't means test for, for example, for jobs under 5,000 or 10,000. Um, so, so the number of people being means tested has certainly dropped. But the average contribution has increased. So for those people who do have a contribution, that's gone up from around 1,500 to um, 3,500. And nationally across England, that was worth 15 million against a total budget of um, about 450 million. So relatively small percentage in, in terms of what means testing provides to the system these days. So 
that was the um, that was the DFG Delta data. Um, we've got a report coming out with those charts in and a little bit of analysis on it, um, which will come out alongside the allocation for the allocation announcements for um, 2020, which will hopefully be coming fairly shortly. I mentioned these at the start of the um, start of the webinar. So we do do um, free DFG basics training, which is a half day in-house course, looks at the legislation and regulations, and looks at how you can use your discretion using regulatory reform order and housing assistance policies, looks at what good looks like, and we go through some ombudsman cases where things have gone wrong in the past. So that's completely free of charge. Just get in touch with us here at uh, Foundations HQ and we'll set that up for you. I think we've trained about uh, 500 people over the last uh, four or five months, so it's, it's proved very popular. So if, if you're interested in that, uh, please get in touch. And another thing that, that we do, and I, I did one of these in, in Leicester just last week, is, is a process workshop where we look at your processes and procedures with you, um, look at what you need to do, remove some of the things that perhaps you don't need to do, and rebuild the system looking at who does what. Um, works really well in terms of prioritising where, where you can save some time and, and kind of free up resources to make the system work better. And again, it's totally free of charge. So if you're interested in doing that, then, then please get in touch and, and we'll arrange that with you. Um, there's a couple of questions in terms of the um, quarter budget and the coming release. The um, budget itself is, is, next, is, well, is in March. So I don't think there'll be any extra funding for this financial year. And you may have seen that um, allocations for the Better Care Fund have already been announced that it will be a kind of a standstill from last year. So we just want to look at that in terms of DFG, but I, I would expect it to be roughly comparable to last year in terms of the overall figures, if, if that helps you with your planning. Um, in terms of, um, Sean was asking about breakdown on timescales and best practice. Those were the two measures that were included within um, within the questions. And basically what the question was asking for was the time scale between a full grant application and grant approval. And actually quite a number of local authorities so they did that within zero, within no days. So zero days were, were quite a significant number actually. And it, actually if you've got, um, got your processes lined up, the, the actual approval of the grant should be a fairly straightforward system, or fairly straightforward process. And then the second question was, how long does it take between the grants uh, grant being approved and the work's being completed. So those were the two questions it asked you in terms of working days. So what, what I said on, on DFG funding for Helen was that it's likely to contain or very similar to the um, this year. Um, so hope, hopefully you heard that this time. Okay, just, just, for, just for a final time, I, th I think we've perhaps got some issues with the sound, which, which we're looking for next time. Um, but basically the um, allocations for 2020 are likely to be the same or very similar as for 2019. In terms of the national review, um, as, as you may notice, there was a kind of Brexit in elections and things going on before Christmas. And now those are out the way. Um, that, that will be... Um, be developing this year, I think. So um, keep your eye on these webinars and on the uh, Facebook group. That's where you'll hear about all those things first. So as I mentioned, we have a private Facebook group, which means that uh, you have you have to answer a few questions to get in. You, you don't we don't just let anybody in. But uh, if you're interested in DFG and, and assume you are as you're listening to this webinar. And it's uh, it's a free thing to join. There are 700 and odd of your colleagues from across the country there, and that's generally where all the DFG news is posted first, um, and and where we kind of have discussions about um, things that we can't say publicly sometimes. So um, I'd uh, suggest you you join there for all the latest news and information on on DFG before everyone else hears it. And we quite often do kind of consultations there as well, which is which is quite useful. And I, th I think the great thing is that if you've got any questions that are DFG related, there's 700 people there that are, are there to help you. So uh, quite often somebody posts a question and they get about 10 to 12 responses within an hour. So um, 
any DFG related issues, I would definitely recommend you join the Facebook group. So our next webinar is on the Thursday, the 27th of February. Um, we'll circulate the link to sign up for that. Um, we've live streamed it today on Facebook. I think a few people were struggling with the Zoom software, so we can also live stream it on YouTube if that works better for you. Please let us know. Um, if there's anything you'd be interested in hearing on these webinars, then, then please also let us know that and any other feedback would be appreciated. Um, and then we'll be preparing for the roadshows, as I say. So that's where we'll be releasing a lot of the new material. We've done some recent reports around, um, as well as our reports on Delta data. We've done a report looking at um, time spent per member of staff under every DFG, efficiencies of the system. And we've got another report coming out on handy person services. Um, but that, that, we'll find out more about those at the DFG roadshows, which hope to see you there in Leeds, uh, Birmingham, and London. So I will sign off at that point. Thank you all for joining us. I hope you found the first webinar useful. So any feedback would be much appreciated. And uh, we'll see you again on Thursday, 27th of February. Thank you.